in the interest of time, moving forward, let's get to our first movie. Uh, this one is the The Devil and Daniel Webster. It's a nineteen forty, which you have been talking about since day one of us starting this podcast. I have because if you're going to mention the devil, I mean, obviously, this is one of the few films. Even though they still don't call him the devil in the movie, they call him Scratch. The old Scratch. Uh, he is. Yeah, but he's legit the only one who takes on the title, unlike some of the others. Correct. So it's a 1941 film, so very early in, in film history. I mean, this literally most of the players in this movie uh, were talkies, uh, or, or were new to talkies in this film. They actually, were, there's a lot of silent film actors in this film. For, uh, so that tells you how old, uh, you know, uh, all this is. Um, it was directed by William D. Turley, I believe is how it's pronounced in German, um, or Wilhelm is what his original name was, and before he immigrated. Um, and I'm just going to give you all a little history on some of these actors and actresses because uh, none of us are going to know any of the movies he's in because there's a lot of like war movies, western films, that sort of thing. Back in the day, that's apparently all they made. But uh, William was actually the, the director was actually a German-born actor before he became a film director uh, that immigrated to the U.S. with his wife during the 30s when political and economic situations in Germany were worsening. So he's one of the people that came over, you know, whenever Hitler was kind of on the rise, you know, in, in, in that country. You made it, buddy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he... And, and the funny thing is, is that he actually, whenever he, he worked uh, in a film, uh, one of the films that he did was uh, for... Uh, uh, w. Uh, F. Murnau, I believe, was the, the director's name, uh, who, who was the director for the original Nosferatu. Uh, Deterle actually played a character in the, the German version of the Faust uh, uh, film. So not only did he act in a film about Faust, he actually turned around later and you know directed an American film about the Faustian type legend. So I thought that was kind of interesting that he had that link there. Yeah. He was primarily known for his biopics like Louis Pasteur and uh, Emile Zola. And it's funny because one of the films that he ended up making uh, is the reason that they have those little blurbs then or, you know, in movies that says, you know, everyone in this movie is depicted, depicted as a fictional character. You know, there's no links to, you know, people living or dead. It was because of him, because he he made a film about a, a, a certain historical figure uh, in, um, I believe it was the, during the Russian czars or whatever, like one of the last Russian czars uh, before Rasputin kind of, you know, did his thing. And the, the family member, the surviving family members uh, felt like it was libel or slander or whichever one that ends up being uh, against their family. So they sued the company for like tons of money. And he... Um, and, and so after that, they had to put that on there so that if they, you know, ever made any movies after the fact, you know, they couldn't get sued for them. Cause it's like, nope, this, that's not the real person we're talking about. It's a fictionalized version, you oh know, my God. <laughs> the principal players in this film are uh, Walter Houston, who plays the devil or scratch. And, um, like I said, he's probably the only time we've actually had somebody called the devil in, in one of these films. Uh, he is clearly the antagonist of the film. I mean, if you have the devil, I mean, you know, he's kind of got that role and, uh, probably the biggest film that he, that people nowadays might still remember him from was the, the treasure of Sierra Madre, which is a pretty big, you know, Western type film. Edward Arnold plays Daniel Webster, uh, which is our, probably one of the few times in film or any history that I know of where there was the good guy's actually a lawyer. That's kind of strange. Oh uh, Yeah. <laughs> And a uh, funny thing about him was he gave up losing weight uh, to play leading man parts. And uh, he said it was one of the best ideas he ever had because when he uh, when he became a character actor, because he had the comment that the bigger I got, the better character parts I got. So <laughs> he, he just uh, he became. Uh, yeah, he just became chunky and uh, got got better roles. Um, uh, his probably the biggest one that most people might know him from is Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And uh, we have Simone Simon, who played Belle, who's the temptress or the whore of Babylon in this film. The whore of Babylon. Uh, <laughs> Enjoy your luxury kind of what whore I got of Babylon. Of <laughs> <laughs> uh, she actually started out as a bit of a diva in Hollywood because uh, some other actors gave her the advice that... Uh, 
that that's how you kind of got, uh, you know, uh, more your point across that you were something big was to act big. And, uh, it just pissed a bunch of people off. So eventually she uh, ended up moving back to France, uh, or at least for a little while. But when World War II started, she came back to the U.S. And that's whenever she started recording films uh, for RKO, including this one. And so she legitimately filled her role as Whore of Babylon <laughs> for a minute there. Basically, yeah. And a little bit of trivia about that was is that um, uh, Edward Arnold, who played Daniel Webster, uh, shared a uh, dressing room that was close to hers. And he said he could hear through the walls uh, Walter Houston, who I just said played the devil, uh, hitting on her, basically. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> um, but she was in a few films by Val Luton, who's kind of like a, you know, of his day. He was kind of the Roger Corman, skeezy, you know, uh, horror film director. Uh, she starred in movies, uh, The Cat People and The Curse of the Cat People, which were kind of sensualized, you know, for the time. You know, they the, the, the cat women in those were, you know, overly sexual for, you know, what was acceptable. So... Um, she kind of, you know, continued on with her horror Babylon stuff, I guess. I liked her in this film. She was, um, she played the a villainous role very well. Yeah. And I want to make the comment that, um, as opposed to, uh, the devil's advocate where I, I felt like, you know, I, I, I wondered how, uh, Keanu could kind of cheat on, you know, uh, Charlize Theron with, you know, that with his sister, basically in that film, uh, you know, because I didn't really see, I mean, because you know, Charlize, even whenever she, you know, was uh, looking more homely at times was still more, you know, I don't know, more, she gave more of a, like a she sensualized, was way hotter. you know, <laughs> yeah, more poor, but I mean, I'll just, in, just in her actions, she even was like, you know, it's like, whatever you want to do, honey, I'll do it for you. I'm, you know, you know, kind of, a, um, you know, I'm, I'm into all kinds of things. It's like, so why would the guy, you know, ever step out in this movie, you get why, you know, Bell has the attraction because even though his wife is probably way, I mean, in my opinion, was prettier oh, in the yeah. face. Uh, Bell, you know, gave that vibe off. It's like, all right, I'm down. You know, let's do this. <laughs> Whatever yeah. you want to do. And I mean, they really, <laughs> really dumbed down his wife. She never changed her, you know, character, personality. Everything stayed the same, no matter how much things were changed. Situations around her were changing. Whereas Bell, her outfits just get more and more luxurious, and you know, they really played her up as a beauty so much in this film. So. Yeah, and she yeah, was they, DAF, you know, down as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little DTF too. Who knows? Yeah, um, yeah. I I just felt like that it it made more sense to me, like in the movie, that you know she would have that attractiveness to him, just because I mean, for the time especially, she was an outgoing woman, you know, like where his wife was kind of the submissive, you know, housewife or whatever that was kind of expected for the time. Belle was more like the, you know, like let's gamble, let's you know, let, let's. Let's just ride horses all day and not do anything. Let's go, you know, uh, do other things, you know, and it's that, that sort of, uh, I could see that being more of an attraction than, you know, how they portrayed it in The Devil's Advocate. You have uh, James Craig, who plays uh, Jabez Stone, uh, who's his uh, down on his luck farmer, who eventually turns into a pure asshole. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he was in a couple of... Uh, Ed Wood films, actually, uh, Venus Flytrap and Body to the Prey, uh, Body of the Prey. So that's kind of weird that you know he eventually did some some uh, J uh, Ed Wood movies. Um, Anne Shirley uh, or Don Everly or Evelyn Paris, as she was known before she took on that stage name, plays Mary Stone, who's the long suffering wife. Uh, she actually took her stage name from Anna Green Gables, which <laughs> was her first major role as an adult. So it's kind of weird that like. You, if you look on her film credits, like Anne Shirley plays Anne Shirley. Like, I mean, that's, <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, yeah. but she took that name because of the character. Uh, she was actually a child. Which is funny. I, I, Anne of Green, I don't, you need to know right away. I don't watch old films. I don't like them. I never really have, but I really liked the books and the um, movie Anne of Green Gables. That's, that's pretty cool. I mean, I, did you, were you aware that's how she got her name that because of that? <laughs> no idea. Nope. She's actually she was actually a child actor um, that quit acting at the age of twenty six just three years after filming this movie. So this was actually one of her last films. Yeah. Holy shit! Because I'm like, how old? She looked young in the film. She's very pretty. Um. Holy crap! Like, 
what she do? Be a model for the rest of her years? Because she was gorgeous. I, I think she gave up on all that stuff. Like, I mean, if I remember right, she just, you know, um, went into uh, just uh, preferred the seclusion that she had. And I, I guess she was wealthy enough that she could just kind of, uh, you know, between that and marrying, in, you know, like, you know, she married well, you know, what time she did. So between all that, oh, okay. she didn't really have to work again. So she was just kind of done with it at that point. Can we address real quick how... Most actresses change their name to sound more luxurious or more exotic, but she went from Don Evelyn Paris, which is a, in my opinion, a gorgeous name, to Anne Shirley. <laughs> yeah, usually it's the opposite way. <laughs> Let's dumb it down a little bit. That I mean, I guess it worked in terms of that she was pretty much, I think, over Hollywood. It sounds like, but at a pretty young yeah. age, so. I don't understand. Ah, the power's going out. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm okay. <laughs> you, are you going to make it there in your darkened studio? No, it's not darkened. It turned on again, but it's scaring the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I know there's a cause. It's not like there's some spirit coming after me, but I'm just, look it. It's fun being this scared. Okay. Like if you have my spirit and you get terrified easily, it's, Halloween is real fun. If, if I could feel <laughs> that again, that would be great. But like I said, I'm dead inside. If you could feel, yeah, you're, you're numb. So, <clears throat> okay. Moving on. So sorry. Back to no, it. Well, I was going to say, I actually misspoke earlier, misspoke earlier. It wasn't William, uh, deter, that, uh, that did the, the movie. It was actually, it was Anne Shirley played an uncredited role, uh, uh, as a child actress in the movie uh, Rasputin and the Print uh, and the Empress, um, where she, um, where it was uh, the inaccurate portrayal led to uh, uh, MGM and every other studio uh, having to add that tagline about fictitious people because you know they got sued so uh, horribly over it. So that was kind of a you know where that came from. Oh yeah, so the I mean I know we, you already mentioned this, but like uh, all characters in this film are. Fict fictitious or fictitious and whatever, uh, not related to any other real life event. You mean that kind of tagline? Yeah, or yeah, they, yeah, they have disclaimer? to. Add, they have to add that now because MGM got sued so badly over that film, the Rasputin and the Empress, or whatever, because they, the there was a prince in that movie, a prince and a princess. Uh, related to the royal family that that the portrayal uh you know the relatives thought the portrayal was so slanderous that that you know that they were that, you know they were just like nope nope you're never you're you're going to pay us money because that's you know that's defamation that's not how that happened and uh, so. i feel like that draws more attention to the film too just like the uh I, I feel like you could do the opposite too to really garner attention you know like inspired by quotation mark true events <clears throat> Um, House, House of, of the, the Devil. Devil. <laughs> <laughs> so dumb. Uh, well, it works, though. Um, yeah, it did. <laughs> we have uh, Jane Darwell, who plays Ma Stone, who plays the pious mother. Uh, she's probably the most famous of the, anybody in this film just because of her portrayals and uh, uh, Grapes of Wrath, which, you know, that, Holy that's, shit. that's a film that, you know, is shown to school children, you know, th you know all the time. Uh, Books she, and movie, yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, she was in almost all the Shirley Temple films. <laughs> wow! And she actually played did a Mary she play Poppins. A mom? <laughs> <laughs> she probably I did. Know, I saw that. Holy shit, dude! Yeah, she uh, she was uh, definitely. I mean, you know, getting it done as far as like just you know, uh, character actress and a lot of these older films, and uh, just rounding out the. And this is just a bit part, but I got to mention it. You have H.B. Warner, who plays John Haythorn, uh, who plays the ghost judge in the the trial of the damned at the end of the movie. I wanted to bring him up a because he was in a wonder and it's a wonderful life with uh, where he plays like the 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 uh, druggist or whatever that that almost kills the you know the, the kid or whatever poison at the beginning of the movie, uh, which is a kind of a cautionary tale to anybody who you know. Um, is a incorporation or something like that. And you have like, you know, employees doing any kind of work that requires, you know, that could hurt other people and it's mental work. You might want to let them have more time off to grieve, you know, just throwing that out there oh, because yeah. they, they could possibly kill somebody. Um, who's also in Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Like we said earlier, he was a silent film actor before he became in, you know, before he went into talkies and, uh, one thing I want Talkies, to mention—that is so funny. <laughs> that's what they called them, you know. But uh, I know. 
uh, the ghost judge is 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 really interesting because John Haythorn was one of the original Salem witch trial uh, judges. And his ancestor was the author Nathaniel Hawthorne, who actually changed it. And I, and I actually almost changed this in my notes until I realized it wasn't a typo. Haythorne was the original family name, but Hawthorne changed his name because he didn't want to be associated with his terrible ancestors, which is only like maybe two generations removed. Oh, my God. And I'm, I'm glad you said that because I really thought it was John Hawthorne. <laughs> no. I thought John Hawthorne was the um, one of the judges over the Salem witch trials. There was uh, there was a few because, well, now I'm thinking there's witch trials all over. So not necessarily just <laughs> outside of Salem. There are others. But I thought it was Hawthorne. I, I thought it was, too. And I almost changed it in the show notes. But then I went back and read. And it's like, no, because uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne actually changed his name just so it's like, nope. At which I would have changed it completely something different altogether because the W is not really going to you know make you. But I mean, I guess he wanted that connection just enough because of where he wrote about that sort of stuff that, it you know, gave it its authenticity. But he didn't want to you know necessarily say, well, I'm cool with what they did. I, this is what I take it to be. Um. Yeah, and I'm I, I googled it. Yeah, so if you Google John Hawthorne, it will redirect you to John Hawthorne. Which holy shit! <laughs> and I'm I'm going to discuss like the 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 people in the in the jury of or the trial of the damned, but a little bit later because there there's some cool fictional or I mean historical stuff that goes along with them too. But uh, I just thought that was cool that they you know actually that's who that's supposed to be and and. He played the, I mean, the character well. I mean, he, you know, really, he had that authoritative, no nonsense, like, you know, I, I'm here to prosecute you and, you know, condemn you, look or whatever. Yeah. Um. The so as far as the movie goes, just I'm gonna throw out some trivia first before we really get into the discussion here, and we can discuss things as we go along, you know, that ties into this. But it was adapted from a 1936 short story of the same name. Um, the film was originally released under the title All That Money Can Buy to avoid confusion with another RKO picture that was released that same year called The Devil and Mrs. Jones, which had nothing to do with the devil whatsoever. It was just kind of a comedy uh, about people doing bad things. But I mean, that's, you know, that. but they didn't want the name association, so they changed it, which is funny because the next movie we discussed, Constantine, had the same problem. Um <laughs> Uh, they was originally going to call that movie. I'm just going to throw it out there. There's going to call Constantine Hellblazer after the, what the comic was called, but Hellboy yeah. had just came out. So they didn't want the association there. So they changed it to Constantine. Um, oh my God. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Which now knowing what we know, it would have worked, but yeah, I absolutely would have. Every time I see Mike post a Hellblazer um, episode, I keep thinking of Hellboy for some reason, so it 100% makes sense. It does make sense. People have simple minds like myself, so <laughs> hey, I'm with you guys, okay? I am the spokesperson, and we have sweet jean jackets if you want to join the club. <laughs> but I, I don't know. All that money can buy sounds just too generic to me. I think the devil and uh, Daniel Webster just stands out more. Um it eventually did have its title restored, obviously, but it also gone by the name uh, Mr. Scratch, Daniel, uh, and the Devil, those two different names. So Mr. Scratch was one of its alternate titles, and then Daniel and the Devil. And also, here is a man for some weird reason. So this movie's had like all kinds of weird renames. Um, it's obviously a story. Uh, it's a, a, The story's an adaptation of the German legend of Faust, but set in the 1840s New Hampshire. Um uh, and like I said, F. W. Murnau, who directed Nosferatu, uh, also directed Faust, um, which is a movie that Wilhelm uh, Dieterle was in. Uh, members of the uh, to go toward the you know some trivia about the people who were to trial of the damned. The members of the jury for uh, J. Best Stone Soul included Benedict Arnold, which for anybody outside the U.S. this is for our Swedish folks. I mean, you probably heard about this. Uh, famous uh, betrayer in American folklore because he uh, he was one of our strongest uh, soldiers and uh, swapped sides and uh, for and forever made the term Benedict Arnold mean traitor in American history. So that's that's why he's there, um, and he's the most famous. That's why they give him more screen time. We have yeah. Uh, we have. I mean, they specifically say it too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We have uh, Steed Bonnet, who play, who was a gentleman pirate of Barbados, who sailed to Nassau and worked with Blackbeard, uh, which is funny because we actually have Blackbeard. 
Okay, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. I have to interrupt you. Why did they? Why did they refer him uh, as the he was, gentleman I, pirate? I think it was because he, at first, he wasn't one of those ones that were like all about blood and you know and and all and like Blackbeard was. He wasn't about the fear factor as much as some of the other ones. He was more about just taking the money, and he he was he had a little bit of honor to him. If you uh, you know, I, I believe if I remember right about him, that if you, you know, did what he said and, and, you know, you didn't tr try anything on him that he would honor, you know, whatever agreements he made with you. So he was more, you know, he was more that type pirate, you know? Um, and, okay. and I think he also got into it like later in life, as opposed to some of the other ones, like it was more like he, you know, he did other things before he turned into that. Um, Okay. Uh, governor Dale uh, is uh, was the English naval commander and deputy governor of the Virginia colony, one of the first uh, American settlements. Uh, he was known for his extreme pursuit of legal order in the colonies and was said to have broken many men on the wheels. So he was a torturer, basically, and that's the reason he, oh, you know. Shit. Um, Captain Kidd was a Scottish pirate, so it's kind of weird that they lump him in here as being an American. But I, you know, I guess the time there wasn't really anybody who was. There was a lot of people that were Americans that wasn't born on American soil, so there was that. Um, he, Captain Kidd had to be hanged twice, and his body uh, uh, because of. Uh, here's here's a weird thing about him. They went to hang him. And it didn't take like it, it like the the rope broke, and a lot of people, you know, in the crowd said, "Well, that was a sign from God that he didn't need to be, you know, hung, and that he was forgiven." And uh, the people at the time were so pissed off at him. There's like, no, string string him up Holy again. Shit. And the second time took. Okay, I so I, <laughs> got, I got a side story real quick. This you know this reminds me of you're gonna get so mad at me for this. What's that? Reminds me of how I keep bringing up death erections to Daphne. <laughs> yeah. Because hanging is one of the number one causes of death erections. Oh, wow. Okay. So you had to throw that in there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We can move on. <laughs> um, they they hated Captain Kidd so bad for all the uh, villainy that he that he did that uh, they left his body hanging for three years as a sign to other par uh, pirates about what's going to happen to him if they got caught. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, do you think that really phased pirates? Because I feel like pirates, like, would probably have skeletons, like, not hanging, but somewhere on their ships and were to warn other people, like, we will do this to you. I kind of, I kind of feel like they, it was like two sides of the same coin. The pirates were like, whatever, we've got, you know, like you said, we've got our own skeletons we're hanging from the front of the ship. You want to pull that shit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Throw out there, Edward or Teach as they as he's coming up is actually Blackbeard. So you know, whenever I said Steed Bonnet or whatever worked with uh, Blackbeard, well, Blackbeard comes up later, you know, from the the pits of hell. So and and Blackbeard's a very famous pirate. He was very bloodthirsty. Um, these guys I'd never heard of before, but these are probably the worst ones of the bunch in my opinion. Maybe just because of the connection of what area they worked in. But Big Harp and Little Harp were actually brothers that were the first known serial killers in the United States. Uh, they were suspected to kill uh, up to 39 people in the areas ranging from, Miss from Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Illinois. Uh, they were... Oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> they were highwaymen and river pirates. So if they caught you out, you know, they would take your stuff and kill you. That's basically what they did. How have I not heard a podcast of these two? I don't know. When I saw that, I was like, I, you know, I've heard every other person but these guys. Yeah. Uh, Simon Gurdy, uh, he is, uh, I think, I can't remember how they refer to him in the film. It's something about, uh, the renegade, I think is what they, uh, what, uh, the scratch refers to him as. Uh, he was a loyalist to the British that turned against the colonists, just like, you know, Benedict Arnold. Uh, but he was more known for have aiding the British or on the side of the Indians. So that's right. He was, you know, he, he dressed like the Indians at the time. He, you know, was known for scalping, you know, that sort of thing. So that's, that's where Simon Gurdy figures in. And then a the little cultural appropriation, huh? Yeah. <laughs> he, well, he was, he was kind of big into that. And of course, and the scalping thing came from you know the British anyway. So if if you don't know your history, I mean the the, the Indians didn't invent that or natives. How are you what say I it? really thought my people did. That's the <laughs> one thing I talk about all the time about how Indians were savages. Uh, Thanks for paying for my college. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, you ha- and then you had Floyd or Flood Irison, who was a falsely accused captain who tried to rescue the crew of another sinking ship. This one's bad. This guy actually wasn't was me- wasn't mean at all. And I don't. In re- reality, he I don't know if he would have. I mean, well, you know, it depends on your view of Christianity and if he was saved or not. This guy actually would never have made it, you know, into hell based upon what he was accused of because he. He saw this sinking ship out in the ocean, or and and he, he and even though his crew said no, leave it alone, we have no business with this. He's like they're dying, the people need help, so he did everything he could, risking his own life and his crews to help these people. Uh, it was disastrous. It didn't work. The family members found out that he was uh, at least involved on the ship somehow before it sunk. They all blamed him for the deaths, and then they they uh, and and they put him to uh, and then and then his own crew turned on him, flipped on him, and said that he yeah he he did this or whatever because they didn't want to you know oh, be shit. hung. So they he got blamed for trying to be a good Samaritan, basically. Oh, that is <laughs> fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have a uh, Walter Butler, who was a British loyalist, who was accused of ordering the killing of women and children at the Cherry Valley Cherry Valley Massacre. So that guy deserved to be in the, you know, I mean, that's deliberately. He was like, no, kill them all, women and children. He was one of those guys. He was the original to probably say, "Fuck them kids." <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the two that they mention otherwise, Ace of the Black Monk and Morton the Vicious Lawyer, they they don't really have any analogs anybody can think that can come up with. So that was kind of just something that was added to the movie. Kind of they had round. to have at least one bad lawyer in there. <laughs> yeah, they had to, they had to have a bad one in there. Um, originally in the movie, Thomas Mitchell was cast as a part of Daniel Webster. Uh, and even most of the movie was actually filmed with him in the role, kind of like, you know, you have Eric Stoltz being, you know, filming most of the movie of Back to the Future before they actually got, you know, uh, Marty McFly to be the, the, you know, the right actor. But, um, Thomas actually, well, the only reason he, he did not finish the film and they actually, you know, cast Arnold in his role was because of the fact that they were filming a scene that involved a horse carriage and he had a major accident, which actually caused him to have a cracked skull that took over a year for it to heal. So Good they, God. so they just had to go back in and film different scenes. And, and one of the scenes that they had to film it, that they worked around in particular was the scene where Mary goes to visit Daniel later in the film, where she's got concerns about how her husband's like, you know, this is the point where Jabez has got the fancy mansion. He's been with Belle for, you know, at least two or three years, mostly, you know, not really paying attention to anybody else. Um, or actually it's been several years. Cause I think the kid's seven at that point. And, um, yeah. And and those whole that whole scene where she's talking to Daniel Webster and uh, that was actually a scene where she was talking originally to Thomas Mitchell and they just cut and and the way they cut the film they just put Arnold in you know and instead as the person she was talking to and uh, and Shirley said whenever she saw the film she was just kind of surprised to see how it worked out because it was not how she filmed it at all. Historically, I mean, the reason Daniel Webster is the one that was chosen was he was one of the most influential senators in U.S. history. His name was put up there with Henry Clay and, you know, some of the others that are, you know, big and, you know, like as far as like their oratory skills, ability to to get people on their side, that sort of thing. Um, he, He was very skilled in debate. Um, but he was also, I mean, he's kind of a weird figure because even though he was known as being so, you know, well, his job as far as convincing people to do what needed to be done, he very, led a very opulent lifestyle and, um, his leadership, uh, abilities were very much up for debate, uh, uh, along with his mor- morals because, uh, you know, uh, something they portrayed in this movie pretty accurately was him always wanting a drink. Uh, uh, actually Daniel Webster died of cirrhosis. He was a really big drinker. Ooh. Uh, but, um, he was one of those kind of lawyers who would, who talked a good game. He always was on the right side of whatever argument he was saying. But if, if, if any kind of scrutiny or pushback came to him, he, he, he cowed to it. So that's where a lot of, uh, huh. historians kind of give him shit over. It was like, well, he was right in what he said, but then if anybody, you know, was like, well, you know, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't have, uh, we shouldn't abolish slavery in this, you know, whatever state because it'll cause this. He's like, all right, all right. You know, he would just back off of it really quick. So that was one of his biggest yeah. problems. Let's see. Uh, let's see the shortcut. The shortcut to happiness is a modern retelling of the story, which I was not aware of. Uh, and this is so horrible that this happens to come up at the time it did. 
<laughs> the shortcut to modern or to happiness is a modern retelling of the story starring Anthony Perkins uh, of Psycho fame as Daniel Webster, a publisher, and of all people, Alec Baldwin plays J. Beth no. Stone. Wah, wah. Yep. Uh, Horrible timing. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt played the devil in that movie, so that's kind of interesting. Ooh, a little bedazzled vibe there going on. Yeah. Uh, William Daterle, uh had a habit. I would have pronounced it Dieterle. You're doing way better than I am. <laughs> well, I, I, I listened to something like on loop. It was like how to pronounce it. For some reason, that name has got uh... a YouTube video pronounced just for it. Uh, he... The director always had a weird habit of wearing white gloves, and everybody in the crew assumed it because he was a germ phobic. But there was a scene where they, they put that was put to shame, uh, and they don't really know he must have had a fetish for him because there was a scene where one of the uh, carts um, needed more mud on it, and he just walked over there, took his gloves off, you know, uh, very simply, and and picked up a handful of mud, slapped it on the cart where he wanted it at kind of just haphazardly wiped the mud off his hands, leaving some still on there, and put the white gloves back on over top of it. So clearly he didn't give a shit about germs. He just liked wearing white gloves. <laughs> Maybe he was sensitive to the touch, meaning like in Haunting of Hill House, I mean, whenever he, little, he touches ha- other people, he can feel. He could have had a little bit of what Theo had going on. That's true. Yeah. There's a sound that accompanies uh, the introduction of Scratch in the film that can barely be heard now, I, uh, I, but it's but it's mentioned uh, because the, now you hear more of the sounds of the animals screaming when he's fir- when he first shows up in the barn scene. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, it was created by uh, ha- the director had a bunch of people go out to uh, like I think it was right outside San Francisco at the time where the power lines were at and it was like 4 a.m. like whenever it was be its loudest where you could act because the power lines in those days were like you know very unshielded and so they could actually hear the hum of the electricity as they flew through them and they that's what they recorded and he just played and he and the composer played the note c over top of it to kind of give it more of like a ethereal effect but it's basically you're hearing like electrical Hmm. lines humming whenever he pops up that's creative as fuck yeah that's for especially for the time so we we talked about in the past how some of these other films have created their blizzards. You know, we talked about in Krampus how it was you know foam and baby diapers and how in uh, in, <laughs> in uh, Legend it was salt and you know and and, that, and foam as well. Well, they didn't have all that fancy stuff back in the you know, back in these days. The blizzard effects in this movie, which would be absolutely fucking miserable to work around, were created by using twelve hundred pounds of shredded white onions. 2,500 pounds of mothballs and large amounts of uncooked tapioca pudding. So just imagine working around that. (laughs) No, thank you. Uh, This film... Basically, they had onion tapioca pudding. Excuse me. Onion mothball tapioca pudding. Exactly. That's what they had to smell whenever they were filming any scenes with a lot of snow. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, This film was... uh, was very we- weird for its time and probably weird for nowadays because and which cost it uh, actually caused it to be more expensive than it should have been in, in the sense that it was filmed largely sequentially in order like you know most films they'll film you know like we talked about um uh I believe it was with Rosemary's Baby where they actually filmed the ending of the movie or toward the end of the movie first that was the very first scene that Rosemary filmed was her crossing the street before she ever knew the character uh, or that, you know, uh, Mia Farrow had to film as Rosemary uh, crossing the street. And that was like toward the end of the film. A lot of movies do that. It's all out of sync. Just whatever, you know, locations they can get at whatever times. No, in this movie, it was like, okay, if, you know, let's start out the scene, you know, where it's at the J. Bez's farm. Let's film that. Let's move to the next scene where it's at this. So that's how they filmed this movie was in order. Okay, I feel like the Rosemary's Baby scene, though, I feel like it was like, well, if she perishes walking across this busy street, <laughs> we'll just get another actress. at least I can find, yeah, I can find another actress to fill in the role. <laughs> so there, that's my thoughts on that. Yeah, that could have been what he was thinking at the time. Uh, horrible. <laughs> so it is horrible. Uh, and the composer actually made the score up as they went along, too. So it was like they would film a scene and the composer would make the scene up right afterwards. So that was kind of weird, too. Yeah, but I mean, I feel like that's I feel like that's what they do on a lot of these films or excuse me, these TV shows that we watch. Like they're literally watching the scene and composers make up the music as they feel during the scenes like, you know, like uh, NCIS or some of those type of shows. 
they probably do that, yeah, now for TV, but it, it's just kind of weird to think of a film that way because you think of the, yeah. the composer getting the total film and just, you know, it's like, okay, this scene needs this, this scene needs that. Like, they work through it that way, whereas this film, it was like, you know, the composer was, like, on hand and he would, like, get the dailies or whatever and be like, okay, I'm going to make a, the background sounds to this, you know, or the background music. Uh, that's just, it's, it's kind of a weird way to do it. Hmm. Uh, the scene where James Craig uh, has to do his sinister laugh uh, because the, the his neighbor's crops have been destroyed, but his are perfectly fine. Uh, he couldn't actually come up with a sinister laugh, so uh, Edward Arnold, who played you know Daniel Webster, was the one that, that dubbed his voice in for that one. So when you hear that cackle, that's that's actually Daniel Webster doing that instead. Yeah, which the editing on it was really well done, but I was like, holy crap, his voice completely changed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's a very evil laugh, too. I mean, I was I was, oh, yeah. kind of surprised at that scene. Uh, Walter Houston's Portrayal of the Devil in this is actually different from the short story, in which Scratch is darker in the short story, and he's more soft-spoken. So we, we've talked about that before. We'll probably talk about it again in Constantine, because that's kind of portrayal that... Uh, Peter Stormare went with, but you know we have we have the Lucifer in prophecy, for example, who's very soft spoken. You kind of and it makes sense from the biblical side of things, you know, because he's always whispering in your ear and that sort of thing. And that's kind of the way Scratch was in the original novel. But um, you know, Houston was, you know, he added that folksy, larger than life, you know, portrayal. That was his, you know, that that's what he came up with for the role. And he was a fun devil. <laughs> he was, and the funny thing is. This devil is the devil that Al Pacino used to make his in The Devil's Advocate. It makes so much fucking sense. <laughs> I think if anything, if you think about The Devil's Advocate, how fucking uh, vibrant Al Pacino was as the devil. I mean, he was living his best life, you know? He was. And I mean, it, 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 it makes sense. I mean, on the other side of it, if you think about, you know, I mean, it's almost the same devil that you see Tom Ellis playing in Lucifer. I mean, he, he's larger than yeah. life, very out there, charismatic. You know, he, he knows how to, you know, uh, you know, he knows how to mingle with people like, you know, that way. So it, it, it. Yeah. And always has that devilish grin. Exactly. That's one of the things I loved about this movie, by the way, was Houston. Like that, that grin on his face. Cause it was, it was both. Like, I'm playing everybody like a fiddle, you know, like that. You had that look to it, but also, like, I'm enjoying the hell out of every bit of this. So that's that's kind oh, of yeah. the, the vibe he was giving off. Um, and this is funny. The little Death Holler news trivia. Uh, well, it links to the Death Holler news. Uh, John Fogarty credits the uh, this movie with being the inspiration for Bad Moon Rising. So there you go. Oh, my God. <laughs> Which is funny because I feel like. If you listen to the lyrics of Bad Moon Rising, they're pretty sinister. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know. I, 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 hey, good for him if it inspired him. John Fogarty, you had to know he was on some serious drugs, too, when he did some of his songs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> especially. Uh, I mean, have you heard uh, Looking Out My Back Door? <laughs> oh, yeah. That one's for, you know, uh, tambourines and elephants, you know, in the band. Yeah. Yep. He was seeing some shit. Yeah, for sure. So, Okay. <laughs> and of course, and of course, this movie has been you know is is culturally you know been used uh, many times since then. Not only is the inspiration for things like we mentioned, but it's it's the direct thing that led to like the Treehouse of Horror episode called The Devil and Homer Simpson, where Ned Flanders is the devil, and you know uh, Homer sells his soul for a donut, and then they oh have, my god they have the whole trial of the dam there, and it's it, you know which is funny because their version of it has like the. 76 Philadelphia Flyers or something like that is one is some of the members. And uh, <laughs> so it's kind of, but it's, it's a neat, you know, take on the, on the movie. That was one of my favorite episodes of the tree house of horror. And my kids are on a tree house of horror kick right now, obviously spooky season um, every day it's on. And I think they've probably gone through every single tree house episode at least two or three times just this Halloween season. I, no better way to spend it. I mean, especially if you're a kid, those yeah. are some of the best ones to, to watch. Um, <laughs> just uh, just going into the movie, though, I mean, we kind of just discussed some things during the trivia part of it, but like, I, there's one, it starts the way that the film book ends. I, I like that, you know, bringing it up because it starts out and it's got a scene of, you know, Scratch, you know, he's overlooking the, the, the stone farm 
and he's got his, you know, and he's sitting there and he's kind of just watching and he's kind of conniving a little bit and he pulls out his notebook and he, you know, he's flipping through and he's got all the souls that he's collected or getting ready to collect. And of course he's got Jabez's name there. He's got his age like at 26 and married, no children. And, and he knows that the Jabez is like, you know, kind of like Job, he's right on the line of being, you know, this is like, you know, too much shit for me to handle. And so I just, that, that, that scene starting out of him, like, you know, getting ready to do his thing. And then at the end of the movie where he's been defeated, he's in the same position, the same area overlooking the farm. And he's like, well, who, who do I go after next? I, I tried to get that soul and that was a loss. And then I just like how they ended it where he turns around, looks at the camera, which I don't know how many times they did like the whole camera meta thing where the, you know, but this feels like it was probably one of the first. And he kind of looks at the audience and he's like, you're going to be my next victim. I kind of like that book in. Yeah. You know? The the scenes with uh just that were Jabez like just the the shit they have to go through you know like I mean or he has to go through I mean you know the the family's getting ready to I mean this kind of sets up the you know the Job quality of the, of Jabez you know where he's they they've went all winter is a hard winter in New Hampshire they're wanting to go to church for the first time and some of their Sunday best and of course the dog gets loose. You know, chases the the pig. The pig breaks its leg. You know, Jabez's clothes are ruined for the day. Uh, Ma's trying to read from the Bible, and she you know starts to read about Job, and that's you know that's a little too much uh, you know, on the nose for Jabez. So they you know, uh, which I don't know the meaning of it, but like I think Mary's getting ready to read from the Book of Ruth, and then that's when they're interrupted uh, by the guys from uh, Massachusetts. And, uh, just the, like everything that leads up to it. Cause it's not only that, but right whenever he, you know, the scene where scratch gets introduced like to him for the first time, you, you have like all the stuff that happens to him. He, he's sitting there and he, you know, they don't have enough money to pay for their mortgage. Uh, you know, even the, 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 I think it's butter money. I think it's what she mentions. Mary's like, what about that? And he's like, I spent that for the horse, you know, it was sick. And, and just, you know, and then he loses the seed, which is one of the few things, you know, he he has a, a great little line about how farmers live and die by the seeds. That's, you know, what keeps them, you know, uh, with food and, and, you know, something to sell. And he loses those into the water. And that's whenever he just, you know, finally says, well, I'd sell myself for two pennies if, you know, if, if, you know, right now. And then that's whenever they pop up in his, his pocket or whatever. They do a good job in this movie of setting up just like how, you know, bedeviled he is which it's kind of hinted scratches behind all this too oh yeah which i heard uh the originally in the movie you know how we talked in exorcist how and like there's a version of it where they introduced the face of pizza guy uh like you know like flashes of it throughout the film or whatever you know like to kind of give the hint that the the you know pizza guy's kind of there and the, you know doing yeah. doing his thing they did that with this movie uh they actually had scenes where uh, intermingled quick cuts were a scratch. Like anytime something bad happened on the farm, scratch something about scratch would be you know shown. And it, yeah, I did notice that. And uh, well, they were originally going to have that, like have it more pronounced, but they but they had to cut it out of the film because they said that something about like the way it was filmed, the way it was cut in, it was kind of like uh, people felt it was too disturbing, so they had to cut it out to get you know to get uh, studio approval. But they were kind of going to do the same thing there. They were going to kind of you know better link the fact that every time something bad happened to to Jabez, it was going to be the you know the devil doing it basically. Yeah. They, I don't. They're, the scene where Scratch is introduced, I, I think, is a great scene. No, I mean, in this movie, just because the, you get to see, you know, Houston's portrayal front and center. It's one of the scenes where it introduces one of Jabez's first vices because he goes through every deadly sin, I believe, in this movie outside of, well, no, he goes through all of them because even though he don't kill, he's got rage later on in the movie. But pride is the first one he shows because the, the devil's like talking to him. He's like, well, if I was talking to a Massachusetts man, I'd expect him to renege on his deal. And he's like, you know, but I'm not a New Hampshire man. And that's when Jabez turns around. And he's like, I'm a New Hampshire man. I'll sign it, you know, even though it, he knows yeah. he's damning it. And that, that, that's the first sign that he's, you know, know his pride's coming into it yeah and then you know and then just how the devil you know like gave him the seven years i think the seven you know is is which that's probably oh, this is all probably from the novel too but i just like how they you know they did that where he took his like you know little c cigar and he kind of etched it into the tree and he's like this is our contract and um you know just just the whole way it was acted i i, I think it's a, per a good portrayal of that you know like devil at the crossroads type you know 
uh, scenario that you're yeah. kind of getting these kind of Faustian tales. It's not etched in stone, but it's definitely there on the tree to remind him every day. Um, I'm going to throw in that because I'm not a huge fan of older films. I know that everything before the devil popped in led up to what caused Jabez to sign this contract. But holy shit, did the whole movie lighten up as soon as the devil showed up. (laughs) He really brightened like the movie and really popped it into action in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, they, they had to, I mean, it's just like all the older films, they kind of had to give I mean, they're, they're more known for like the setup, you know, and, and kind of like almost stage play, uh, of the way they do it. I mean, they have to tell the story in a certain way or whatever, but yeah, it definitely like the action picks up the momentum of the film picks up, you know, cause uh, things really start happening. Then that's whenever Daniel Webster, uh, really comes in, you know, comes into the story at this point, which they've introduced the fact before this where, which I liked where they had scratch, like his shadow, like talking, whispering to Webster while he was trying to pin his like missive about, you know, how the bank should allow, uh, farmers to be able to bankrupt, uh, because apparently farmers wouldn't allow that luxury, which is kind of a weird historical fact, but you know, everybody else could bankrupt themselves and, you know, kind of start again at square one, but farmers couldn't, that's kind of weird. But so he was coming up with that, you know, that notion and he, you he, he had scratch whispering to him. It's like, you'll never make president. You'll never, you know, you'll never grow any higher than this. If you keep pinning this, you know, aren't you more worried about the fame, you know? And he, and that's whenever he casts the devil to the side and, you know, finishes on with what he's doing. So they, they introduce, you know, Scratch is playing both Jabez and, you know, uh, Daniel Webster at the same time during this part of the film. All yeah, the- I liked that. Like, he really wanted Daniel Webster's soul. Oh, yeah. And he even has to mention later in the film, whenever he's talking, you know, he, they, they, they have that great scene, which we can bring up now, where, you know, uh, the miser Stevens, the, the, the banker, has uh, did the, you know, the dance of death with uh, Belle or whatever. She's, you know, round and round and, you know, until he's, he's passed away because it was his time to be collected, uh, which is funny mm-hmm. because it came around the same time as Jabez's. So they, they both signed on with the devil at the same time. But, uh, you know, his, his soul is portrayed as like this little moth. And Jabez asks him, you know, the question, he's like, are all souls like that? And he's like, oh, no. He's like, you know, a soul like Daniel Webster would, you know, have a wingspan that would be magnificent. And and I'd have to have a special box to lock him up in. But he's like, your soul, I could fit you in my breast pocket. So it's like another little jab at Jabez that, you know, like his soul is basically You're a dime a dozen, sir. Yeah. (laughs) It's like you're nothing. Uh, but he's really working for Daniel Webster, and and that might be the reason he's work, you know, that he works on Jabez because he know because of the connection between Mary and Daniel will eventually loop Daniel into the fold, and he can use that as a bargaining chip to get Daniel to to if he won't agree to do it willingly for himself, he he knows that he's uh, a mar- you know enough of a, a upstanding individual that he'll you know, he'll stand up for someone else and and sacrifice his soul that way. So that's kind of maybe the devil. It's not really, I mean, it doesn't really say in the movie, but it's kind of implied that he's, you know, that's the reason he's working Jabez because there's a connection there that he can, you know, work Daniel Webster's own good, you know, deeds against him, basically his own, you know, morality. But, um, there just, I mean, when the part of the movie, I mean, just discussing, you know, the movie in general, like you really see a big change in Jabez throughout the film. I mean, like, you know, it, it, he, he tries to stay moral when he first sells his soul and he gets the gold and like, he's paying off everything, but he's a little too free with his money whenever he first starts out. Cause like, he's just buying up everything, which I mean, a lot of it was like stuff for the farm. So it's understandable. But then at the same time, yeah. you know, he starts like being a little bit extravagant with it. Not super, but he's like, yeah, Mary, you go buy something and go buy something nice for my mom. And, you know, even though they just barely scraped by, you figured he'd be, you know, he would wait a little bit longer before he got to that point, but he's already showing his tendencies at that point to, to kind of, you know, just be, uh, you know, worldly, you know, like just wanting worldly goods. And then, you know what though, what surprised me a little bit, I was thinking about it cause I did see him spending that money, but he was buying investments, meaning he was buying stuff to continue working, which 
most people would have been like, I never have, a work, have to work a day in my life again. I have all this money. <laughs> people make stupid mistakes like that, especially lottery winners, you know? Well, that's, that's um, true. But yeah. he invested in farm equipment and stuff like that. So he did it with the intention of still working. Yes, he was letting, you know, Mary buy a bonnet and a shawl for his mom. And apparently those were expensive things back then. <laughs> um, well, in, I have to remember they were really poor. So maybe not expensive, but to them it was. So I don't know. I, I was pretty, I felt that to be somewhat honorable. Yes, he just sold his soul to the devil, but he still wanted to be a working man, kind of. And obviously that changes as we go into the story. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, at that point, he still, I mean, that's what I'm saying. He still spent the bulk of his money on stuff for the farm. So there, there's, he he's still clinging to his, you know, the, the things that makes him a good man. But you can see the hint with the, the little bit of spending that he does on Mary, which I mean, it's understandable. You would want to your your wife to enjoy, you know, this newfound. So there's, I mean, it, even with that, there's a nobleness to it. But at the same time, it's 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 a it's a slippery slope, you know. Like it, it's kind of oh, yeah, like absolutely. you know, he uh, he kind of shows um, he, when and it's right after that uh, that he uh, meets Daniel Webster during a game of horseshoes. So that, that kind of leads into something later on with the gambling and that sort of thing. You know, he's playing these games of luck. That's kind of, you know, um, but it, it also shows the devil has blessed him with luck because he, he wins, you know, like it's no big thing for him to win that game of horseshoes. And that's one of the first signs that the devil is kind of working in his favor to kind of get his luck factor in there. Yeah. And it, and and there's the scene where the dev where Daniel takes the cup of uh, rum or whatever Medford rum I believe it is from the devil which will come in the later into the movie with the, the trial but like he you know yes. he, he takes it and he he's drinking it and you know it, it puts him to sleep and you know that kind of makes him look bad in front of everybody but it gives Jabez the time to stand up and stand out which is entirely what the devil's wanting to do is to get Jabez's name out there so that he can you know become more of a figure in the community and kind of cast some doubts i mean kind of a payback a little bit to um daniel it's like okay well if you're gonna if you think you're such a you know nice and noble man you don't need my help i'm gonna make you look bad by doing this little thing so it's kind of a it's kind of a neat little scene too the one thing that i thought i'm was, laughing at the next scene coming up <laughs> are you talking about the the love scene between uh yes <laughs> i thought this was because i was just laughing because the back in the day when they had to sleep in two separate beds, you know. Well, the sleeping in the two separate beds, but then it's like, uh, you know, you can tell that like they were that like they started out like Mary was just innocently going to, you know, bid him the good night and that sort of thing. But he sees scratch down below, and then there's like, it's almost like there's something that comes over, you know, both of them at that time. That's whenever they, you know, it's like scratch is like, you know, got their libido at like top, you know, notch or whatever. Cause even Mary looks at him. It's like, no, we, we need to do something else now. I don't know what that was. That you yeah. Just saw, but let's go. Um, they, it's funny because it just, there was so many, like it switched back and forth between them, just like staring at each other, which I get. It's supposed to be passionately and it, and it worked, but it was just so funny. Cause it, it, they carried it on a little too long. It's like, okay, just get to it. <laughs> It, but it, it, I don't know. I just thought it was kind of funny. It just in the sense that it's like, you know, he sees Scratch and then like he's kind of just yeah. jauntily walking through the farm. And it's like, and then all of a sudden they, they it's like, what? 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 We got to do something now. This is, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a little antsy. <laughs> oh my God. But there's a reason for that. And, and the reason is, is because that, you know, Mary becomes pregnant, obviously, and that gives up the son, which. It's something that's set up at the beginning of the movie beautifully because there's a little line cryptically that Scratch says to him. It's like, you'll have seven years. And he said, at that time, we, we can renegotiate. And yes. what that sets up later is the fact that when he when he means renegotiate, he's not talking about he's going to give you an extension just based on your own soul. He's already got that. No, he wants your firstborn. You, that's, your, that's your ticket out of this. If you're truly, uh, you know, hell bound, you're going to give up your firstborn, you know, child to him. And and that's that's what causes all this. It's also the cause of Jabez's downfall because whenever, uh, you know, they were supposed to have like a nanny come in or a maid that was just one of the local girls in town, and that's whenever you know uh, I think there's a scratch even mentions to him. He's like, I'm I'm not so crass as to show up at your christening or do anything like that. But he said I will send somebody to you. He said one of my own representatives, and they'll take care of this for me. And like Jabez doesn't know what he's talking about, and you know, is still 
pushing against him at that point, but whenever he sees Belle, he falls under her trance. I mean, she's she's mm-hmm. the emissary of the devil, basically, at that point, from over the mountains, yeah. as she keeps saying. Uh, I don't know what mountains those are, I don't know, but, you know, she's from over the mountains. And there's supposed to be a scene, like they say that, they're, like they introduce her kind of like they do Scratch to a certain effect where they're, they're kind of like, they, they're kind of, there's an optical effect where they're kind of translucent for a second before they fully form or whatever. And that kind of adds to the, you know, the, the whole feeling that she's not from this, this plane of existence or whatever. She's from somewhere else. Yeah. Well, they asked her too. Where One of the guys when they're playing poker at the table, where are you from? And she's like, I'm from nowhere. <laughs> there is a town called Nowhere. We reviewed that booga, booga. straight out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but this is the part of the movie where you know, obviously, you know, Bell shows you know Jabez's lust. That's that's his next seven sin, you know, or or you know, or next deadly sin, you know, because as soon as he's he sees her, he's smitten by her. Like he he's got that look on his face, like I can't think of anything else. He follows her to the barn dance. She kind of plays with him a little bit, and the fact it's like, oh, you you like you know, she she gives him a look like you like what you say. Well, I'm gonna go dance with somebody else and see how that you know makes you feel. And then that's whenever the devil's playing the 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 fiddle, which I thought was interesting. You know, I don't know. If that's gave inspiration to, you know, Charlie Daniels or anything like that. But, yeah. you know, I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, they weren't in Georgia, but, you know, <laughs> close enough. Tomato, potato. Well, New Hampshire men are different than some of the others in some of the other states he's had to deal with. So down down in Georgia, he's, he's used to people reneging on their deals, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, after, uh, after all of this... Uh, it kind of, I mean, you get a scene where his wrath comes into effect for the first time, really for the first time, because he's woken up in the middle of the night by the baby and, and, you know, and he, he has to get up and leave. It makes him so angry. And that's kind of, you know, another one of his sins. Um, he's, he's, he, he goes downstairs though with this scene and this is almost the turning point where he could have went one way or the other. He, he's really debating on, I mean, he's, he's soul searching as it were. And that's when Scratch pops mm-hmm. through the window and kind of, you know, comforts him a little bit. It's like, no, you know, everything's going well. Just remember what you got, which, you, you know, and that and that that little push from the devil keeps him on the, the path to hell, basically. Not that he has any choice because he's already agreed at this, you know, juncture. Yeah. But it's, you know, it it's at a point going where further. Yeah. It's, it's like, how low are you going to sink, you know, like in your ethics and morals, basically? Well, when he went down the stairs. I was like, is he, he was at that door. Was that the door to Belle's room? That's a good point. I think it might've been. I didn't even think about that. Uh, the, yeah. yeah. Cause I got the impression he was going to go cheat on his wife with Belle. And then the devil kind of chit chats with him. It was all just implied, but you know, it was strongly inferred in my opinion, or at least that's just what I got. No, I mean, that's a good point. I didn't even think about that, but that literally was probably what he was doing. He was going down there and he's like, let's. I, I, but th- and then he stopped for a second. It's like, what am I doing? I'm, you know, I shouldn't be cheating on my wife. And you know, and then the devil pops. And it's like, well, it's going to hurt. Look what you, you know, you've got everything. Um, and kind of gives yeah. him that. And w- I, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to throw in that that baby was so cute. <laughs> 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 I mean, he was perfect in all the scenes. It cried. I don't know how they, I don't know if they were pinching that baby or something to get him to cry when they got him to cry. It was like everything, the editing of how they worked that baby in was so perfect. He was sleeping when he needed to be sleeping, crying when he needed to be crying. I was like, oh, and he just had the cutest little face. <laughs> the, I, I just wanted to steal his soul. <laughs> Well, did you want to steal the soul of his uh, ungrateful little brat whenever he grew up to be, you know, uh, what after Bell's years of raising him uh, turned him into a little bastard? Or did you just want to ask him oh off my. the hell? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I just wanted to take him to go see his, uh, his godfather, the devil, <laughs> his anti-godfather. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's something that's mentioned at the time is that Daniel Webster has been named the godfather. He's The son's name is Daniel in honor of him, and, and that kind of sets up mm-hmm. some connections that way too, which is probably something else that the, you know works the, the devil's you know leverage over Daniel Webster that way too because he's got more of a connection to Mary that way. Not only is she just a relative, but now he's got a godson through Mary, so that kind of you know pulls him more into Jabez's you know, uh, side or whatever than he would have been normally. Yeah. 
Uh, the sleigh ride between Bell and, and Jay Bez kind of sets up another one of his deadly sins. It's kind of the sloth. That's the first time where he, he shirks work for the first time. It's like he, he tells her, he's like, well, I can't go out sleigh riding. We've got work to do on the farm. And she's like, oh, that hire people. You've got money now. You don't have to worry about that. You know, playing that little side of him. And that, that's, that's where you lose the honorable part of him, I think, or the, the, the bulk of it at this moment in time. Cause he goes from being, you know, he's helping the other farmers out with the money that he's getting extra he's you know he's still working you know like a, you know doing the you know the, uh, that sort of thing and kind of keeping himself humble and then bell pushes it into his ear it's like you don't have to do that anymore you can just slack off and let somebody else do the work and you know that's that's where he stops kind of being and 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 he stops seeing other people you know in his own as being in his same position too that's whenever the the contracts with the farmers stop start popping up where he starts treating them like miser stevens treated him you know it's like you're just money to me at this point you're not a neighbor you're not a fellow christian you know uh you know a laborer like i am i you know you you either work for me or you don't or you know or whatever but you know and if you want money from me you're going to pay through the tooth yeah and and there's a scene where uh he actually uh, i liked this scene for what it stood for there's a scene where he tries to start reading from the bible right after this like he, oh yeah and bell stops him it's like don't do that you don't have to worry about that you know like let's do something fun you know and that's him turning and not only is he turning away from his you know like the work you know uh, the humbleness of a farmer but he's also turning away from god at this point he starts gambling on Sundays. That's a whole other affront to God, you know. Um, yeah, well, Mary and the mom go to church. <laughs> yeah, and, and they're sitting there and they're listening to the preacher basically give a sermon uh, with actually the line in it. It's like, which is perfect for the movie. It's like either make the tree good and the fruit good or the tree corrupt and the fruit corrupt, which is exactly what's happening with Jabez and his family in general because, you know, like he started out as a good man doing good deeds and it was helping the community out. Now that he's being corrupted by Bell, like, you know, people are starting to hate him. Like the, you know, the family's falling apart. Mary's losing her husband. Uh, the son is, you know, uh, being corrupted and, you know, made into a spoiled brat and that sort of thing. The, and then it, it, Yeah, this is where murder would have <laughs> entered the story for me because, <laughs> I mean, the the... You know, horse rides with the maid, the sleigh rides with the maid, doing everything with the maid. My husband would, even he was like, with the maid? <laughs> and I'm like, well, she's a hot maid. First off, I wouldn't have that in my house. But second, what the fuck? Do you want to die? Because that's how you die. <laughs> Yeah, that was the one thing that I, and, and, you know, this is different times, different cultures. So, I mean, in a sense, I don't know the stand by your man stuff. If that, you know, how, I mean, I, I don't know how she could put up with all that. I mean, you, you. Oh man, she had the fucking patience of a saint. I tell you what. Yeah. And, and even like, this is even when his mom has sold him out. I mean, when your mother's gave up on you and I mean, that's saying a lot. I mean, you know, his mom's yeah. basically like, he's, he's bastard, you know, I, there's nothing to jabez anymore and like mary's like no he's he's still a good man deep down and it's like how are you holding to him like i mean there's there's nothing at this point in, in you know in the film or in in their life that you know gives any hint that he's i mean he, he feels like he's gone too far and like i don't know how mary holds on to the hope that you know that 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 he's still redeemable basically at this point years pass oh um Seven years to be exact. He's about the time his contract's supposed to be up. He's got the huge mansion on the hill that's just been built. Uh, uh, Ma and Mary have, have refused to move into it. It's it's too much, you know. I was wondering about that. I was wondering if I had missed something because we were like, why the fuck is she in the, you know, the shanty house and he's in the mansion with fucking Belle. Well, I wanted to fucking find him through the TV. My my assumption is is that Ma wouldn't go there because it's too uppity, too putting on airs. It's it's shown how much he's degraded, you know, and uh, and and everything about him. But my assumption is that, and it's never specified in the movie that Mary doesn't go there because she she knows at this point she's the secondary woman. There's there's no longer just a mistress. She's the mistress if there's anybody because he doesn't even give her the time of day. There's even that scene which I don't know why he didn't get stabbed over this because this is the worst affront I've ever. I mean, especially to a mother. He tells her that she has no right to discipline his kid and and, and only Belle has to operate. So basically, she's even been supplanted as a mother at this point in the movie. Which is ridiculous. Yeah. 
oh man, I would have fucking lost it. And not only that, but like she's also doing the she's doing like the maid's work. Yeah, yeah. She, that's that's the feeling I got, and I'm like, and and Belle's not doing shit. I'm like, she's the fucking maid. <laughs> yeah, the the maid who was hired in to take care of the kid and stuff, who's not really taking care of the kid because the kid does whatever he wants at this point. She's basically just lounging around in the mansion, drinking, smoking with the guys, uh, maybe doing other things with the guys. I mean, she gives that vibe off, you know, or of Babylon. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, you're right, you know, Mary's the uh, you know at the house cleaning cooking you know for her and ma i assume uh you know jabez is probably nothing of a bastard he stops by and takes their food even though he's probably being fed grapes by bell you know or probably you know whatever so i mean it's like you know she she's totally they reverse roles completely at this point um but there's a dinner party at the house that night and and this is mary's last stand she's decided not only is she she goes to to daniel to kind of vent but also to try to get him to come with her so that she can maybe salvage what's left of her marriage uh which ma's already given up she's like i she i think there's a line between them she's like he's not he's not your husband anymore like you know or, or not he doesn't act like it or whatever you know that sort of thing but She's uh she so she goes to Daniel, but she's also got the idea, or she, and and which leads to that scene between her and Belle, which uh, man, that's a rough scene to watch. Whenever you, I mean, given the context of the movie, it's basically like you know Belle looks at her and is like, "Did you come here tonight thinking that you know like nobody would show up from the town and he would be lonely enough he'd come back to you?" It's like he's got me, honey. You know, like that that sort of you know catty little you know comment at her, just digging in the claws because she uh, Belle's like, "I've won," you know, like you're. You're, you're nothing now to Jabez. Like I've completely taken him over. Yeah, you're not going to win him back. And and that's and and that's kind of what Mary's came to do is kind of play on that and see if she can get him back. And then Belle calls her out on it, and and it doesn't work. So that's whenever it leads to the whole scene where you know uh, even Daniel Webster's fed up with Jabez at this point. He's like, "You're not the man that you used to be. You're not the honorable farmer that I knew." And so him and Mary just leave with their their son, who the son's even cast aside at this point in the movie because the son showing the first signs of empathy in the whole movie after, mind you, he's been scolded for the first time in his life by Dan by his godfather, you know, whipped on the horse or whatever. Um, he's actually acting like a, a friggin' human being for the first time, and he takes in a stray cat, and it actually shows his mother that he's got a little bit of the, the raising she tried to emphasize into him. Uh, that's when Jabez is like, get the cat out of here. That's stupid. You know, like he's even, like he even tell you know, basically treating his son like shit over being, you know, a, trying to have a little decency uh they the, the son ends up siding with the mother he don't want to have anything to do with either one or his dad or bell at this point he he leaves yeah um so i think uh danny webster beat the devil out of him on that cart scene literally beat the devil out of yeah him. uh which he needed to because that kid was being a little shit yeah i mean he was just and he was sitting there like uh, shooting slingshot, you know, stone or throwing stones at the horses as they're riding down the road. And Daniel's like, don't do that again. I've told you once, so, you know, yeah. um, but the, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it takes seeing, it, it takes Jay. I mean, at this point in the movie, I had gave up on Jay Bez. I mean, I, I was oh, like, yeah. I was like, your soul deserves to go to hell at this point. Like you've completely, you know, betrayed and, and, you know, uh, done wrong. Everybody in your life and, and your neighbors around you. And, you know, and I'll be honest with you, whenever he got scared by the devil and the whole scene with the soul and the moth and all that, and that's whenever he decided that it finally comes back to him. It's like, I got to get out of this contract now, you know, and he, he tries to cut down the tree. And that's when the devil's like, you've got one option. You've got till midnight and you got to give me your firstborn son. Um, that whenever that scene happened, I, I like the empathy for the character at that point. I was like, I don't care if you get redemption at this point. You, I mean, leave everybody else alone. You need to pay for what you've done, you know? Mm hmm. You signed a contract, sir. <laughs> and I mean, it, you know, I know the point of it is that Daniel Webster being the, you know, master uh, speech writer, you know, uh, speaker that he is, uh, uh, is able to, you know, save, you know, save uh, Jabez's soul by, you know, convincing the, the jury of the dam that, you know, he's, he's that the contract that you know, 
it should be, you know, nullified because, you know, uh, Jay Bez is right uh, as an American to freedom, you know, uh, and he plays on that. I know that that's like the whole gist of the story, but I really feel like, you know, that, that Mary and everybody else deserve better. I mean, like, you know, I don't, Jay Bez only felt like he was repentant because he was saw the, finally the results of what his, you know, bad deeds were causing. Like it wasn't because it wasn't because he, he, he wasn't, to me, he wasn't empathetic to what he'd, ca- you know, the damage he'd caused. It was more he was worried about the, you know, like just, uh, you know, his own suffering in hell, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah. After he saw what happened to Miser, he was like, it scared him. And, and, and that's, and it's really the, the threat of hell is the only thing that scared him. I mean, like he would have continued on it, it, regardless. I mean, you know, and, and I, he might, and I don't even know at this point uh, if he hadn't seen Miser lose his own soul the way he did and get trapped. He, I, I almost feel like he would have gave up his firstborn. That's almost how far gone he was at that point. So I don't. I mean, may, maybe I'm not giving him the you know the credit that Mary saw in him, but I, 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 I just, I, I just throughout the movie, I just despised him more and more as a character whenever I would see him. Yeah. But you you do have the scene where Daniel comes in and he invokes that speech to the you know the the American man you know born man or whatever that you know their you know their freedom was taken away from them um, you know just you know like getting ready to happen to Jabez and like you know if they could have the option to you know give the devil his due or you know give him what what's coming to him. You know, he basically just plays them against the devil at that point. It's like, do you want to stick it to the devil? You know, say this contract's null and void. It's, I mean, it works in the context of the movie, but at the same time, it's kind of a shit argument because the devil did have a legit contract. I mean. <laughs> he did have a legit contract. And then I was thinking, okay, well, if this voids, you know, Jabez's contract, does it now void the contract of the men previous that are serving on the jury now? Yeah, I mean, you would think that it would, but I mean, I guess because it wasn't, that wasn't the argument that was being made before the jury that, that, you know, I guess that's why it didn't apply. I, I don't know, but it was just like, Boo. <laughs> just kidding. um, there was some interactions between, uh, the characters at this scene. Cause this were the first time you really get to see Daniel Webster, you know, and, and scratch kind of play off each other. Cause they're the big, they're the two biggest characters in the movie. Really? I mean, like as far oh, as like far, their yeah. presence I mean, it's and everything named else. after them. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of funny. It's like, uh, the, the Daniel Webster says to Jabez, he offers him some of that Medford rum, which comes back into it. Like we said, and, you know, and, and, you know, Jabez knowing what the rum did to him initially from the devil's like, you shouldn't be drinking that. And then that's when Daniel looks at me, he's like, oh, just because you sold your soul to the devil doesn't mean you have to become a teetotaler. <laughs> yeah. That was funny. <laughs> um, and then, you know, and then I think that's the reason in the scene, I mean, it's not, it's not directly said, but I think that's the reason in the scene where Daniel is, um, you know, or is, is having trouble formulating his thoughts and how, you know, they got that whole scene. It's like, you know, you're, uh, I can't remember the exact lines, but the, 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 the judge and the jury start chanting the lines about you're going to become one of us. You're going to hell. You've lost. I think they, that's what they say. You've lost. You've lost. I think the reason he's having trouble formulating his lines is because that, that rum's affecting him again, that, you know, just like it did before it's, and it's, and it's kind of, and I don't know if the, if the story was, I guess the story was written after the fact it had to have been, I think that's what the, the author working into the effect of, you know, it was like Daniel Webster's own demon, you know, uh, was, was the drink and that, you know, that, uh, was it was ruining his life in ways he didn't even realize like it was too you know he, he was overlooking his own uh you know kind of uh iniquities at that point yeah it's possible but you know he pulls through it and he makes the argument and you know the win and he wins but i think he he makes this comment in the movie he's like he says that an american citizen cannot be sold into the servitude of a foreign prince and then the devil has this great line set back to him. He's like, um, it's like the little monologue. He's like, he's like, well, I was here. He's like, foreign prince. Why, how do you consider me foreign? He's like, I was here when the first evil was done to the Indians upon this land. I was upon the first slaver ships that arrived on the shores of this country. He's like, I'm not a northerner or a southerner. I'm, you know, I've, I've been here longer than anybody else. So, it's <laughs> scratch has a pretty good point that he's, you know, he's, he's been an American as long as Americans have done evil things. So bitch, I found America, <laughs> not you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and, you know, of course it doesn't go into that, but I mean, you know, even when the natives were here, you know, I mean, you know, he's kind of implying that, you know, whenever the evil was done, that he was kind of behind the scenes even during that time. The devil was responsible for the Wendigo. <laughs> I just know it. <laughs> well, that, that could be the case. That thing's pretty scary. Um, so, you know, Scratch... It, I, I think it's funny in the scene that Daniels offers Scratch whatever money he you know wants or whatever in the in the offer for Jabez's stole before they ever get into the trial. And the devil, oh yeah, that was hilarious. And the devil's like, I don't need that. He's like, but you, there's one thing you can offer me. It's like, well, give me that soul there. It's like you're gonna put that. You're gonna wager your soul that you can save this person or whatever. Um, which again goes to the Charlie Daniels soul, I, you know, or song. I, I bet my soul, you know, or whatever that. Uh, I, I'm better than you, that sort of thing. But um, Jabez Stone <laughs> was the fiddle of gold. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's funny because, like you know, the the one stipulation that that Daniel makes with him, and of course you're dealing with the devil, so he's going to have you know his own tricks up his sleeve. Is like, uh, well, it has to be the jury and the and the judge has to be American men and and you know born and bred and or quicker the dead is what is his own words. And then the devil's like, I like how Houston's eyes light up. He's like, the quicker the dead. He's like, I got an answer to that. And he goes over and he stamps on the, you know, the floorboards and uprises the damned or whatever. And he's like, ah, oh, but they're all American. That's all you wanted. You know, Does okay, it mean- but were they all American? <laughs> because I feel like some of them were like, um, not, why am I saying refugees? Um, not refugees. Um, they were, um, why can't I word right now? They like they migrated over here. Yeah, yeah. Well, they weren't all American born. I know they. Some of them had founded certain parts of America and everything. That doesn't make them American born and bred. Well, it doesn't. But you know, you're dealing with the devil, so you get the best that you you know you can come up. Yeah, with. Yeah, he gives you what he gives you. <laughs> you get what you get, and you don't throw a fit. I, and I just love how every time that he came up with an objection to anything in the trial, the you know Haythorn was just like overruled. Overruled. Yeah. <laughs> Everything was overruled. I was like, well, this isn't fair. Yeah. And he even said. And that so. was not a jury of one's peers, in my opinion. Uh, no. But, you know. The prostitution rest. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it works out in the end. And there's that, that funny little scene at the end of the movie where, uh, you know, well, of course, you know, after all this happens, the mansion's seen burning down the background. That's, you know, the devil's last, or one of his last little jabs at Jabez. It's like, look what you built up. And that's gone. You know, you might've got your soul back, yeah. but you're losing everything else. But he's got all the people back in his fam- his life. And that's the real, you know, that's the real message of the movie. He's like, you know, brought his mom's back on his side. Mary's back with him. I don't know why she would be still, but you know, uh, and then, you know, Daniel Webster's on his side again, and they're all collected around the table. And, you know, the last little jab by the devil, which I think is hilarious, is Ma brings out her peach pie or whatever for Daniel to have since he did such a good job, and it's gone. And you see, you know, you got to see Scratch off in the distance, and he's just wolfing it down. <laughs> it's like a last, a last little... And she's like, what the devil, when she sees the empty <laughs> pie pan? And I just love it, because the devil's just like, you know, that's his last little, fuck you, you know? It's like, you know, you think you got me... And then she brings out like an even bigger, you know, peach pie or whatever and kind of laughs at because that's the whole thing during the movie. She's like the one. And he even mentions at one point in uh, time, he's like, no, I don't want to have any dealings with your mom, you know, because he realizes she's one of the staunch pious people in that in that whole area or whatever. She will not ever listen to him and like he has no hold oh, on yeah. her. So that's kind of like another symbol that she, you know, was better than the devil in the sense that she was already ready for his shenanigans and she had a whole other pie that was even better, you know, made in the background that he didn't even know about. I was laughing at the mansion burning down part because my husband was pretty upset by that. He was like, well, why did he burn down the mansion? They could have lived there. And I was like, you know, technically that mansion belonged to the devil, right? <laughs> I, that that wasn't his. Well, and Mary wasn't going to live in that house, knowing what kind of fuckery went on, literally between him and Bell. There was just there. There's limits yeah. to how much of a suffering wife she was. I mean, and that was one of them. Make him build another house for you guys. <laughs> so, anyways, the 
you know, my rating on this four out of five, it's a classic story told in the classic way. But I mean, it's, you know, it's good. It, it's just that American folklore, you know, like the, the devil, you know, going through like a small farming community and, you know, like working, you know, like every angle he can to secure a soul on, onto his side. And just the way that Houston portrayed the devil. I love how boisterous he was, how, how much fun he was having with every one of his scenes. The effects for the time were great. I mean, even the scene where he throws the ax and like, you know, it catches, you know, and and it catches on fire and disappears or whatever. The way they worked that in with the technology of the time, and I mean, just it, it's a it's a good looking film for you know for its time period, and you know, and it, it's well acted. So it's I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, they did really well. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you on the the effects because you had the whole when Bell, um, I think she was holding a piece of paper and it burned, right? It was some letter that Jabez had wrote to her, allegedly. And he's like, well, that's my handwriting. He didn't remember writing it. And it just burns right in her hand. Like, it was, the effects were shockingly good. That was one thing I remember. Again, I'm going to reiterate how much I do not like older films. I <laughs> don't like watching the classics. I have never seen It's a Wonderful Life. Uh. <laughs> There's something definitely wrong with me. I'm here reviewing films. And, and and I have not watched the bulk of what is considered the best. So that being said. I would definitely recommend It's a Wonderful Life in HD. Ugh, my kids watch it every year. Um, <laughs> it's funny. It's I noticed something recently. Uh, there's two films that in their own respective genres tend to be like within other movies. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life is in every holiday movie you've ever seen in the background on somebody's mm -hmm. TV. And yes. Night of the Living Dead is the horror equivalent of it because where it where it's you know the copyright error and they they can get by with it. It's in every horror film, uh, pretty much that that they can put it in. I was watching Stir of Echoes the other night, and that's one of the scenes where the little kids fighting with the the remote control. Uh, with a ghost or whatever, she keeps flipping the film from like a cartoon his mom put on to Night of the Living Dead, and I'm like, there it is. It's in every movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, but it's, and that would be the easier. But uh, there, but uh, you know, it's a wonderful life is a classic for a reason. So, and I mean, but you know, you know, but I know, I know, <sighs> I need to watch it. Ugh, whatever, kill me. Um, ah, uh, you can't kill me. I'm already dead. <laughs> uh, but you were talking. I don't know why I don't like older films. But you were talking about well, just one thing. You were talking about how the the uh, bells like letter dis you know burned up or whatever. The devil. There's several times where that happens with like any denizen of hell. The devil, whenever he does that. Um, he it's his business card because he goes to hand it to Jabez. Jabez turns around and kind of like ignores him, and the devil just flicks it out of his hand, and it burns up. You know the same way that Bell's does. I thought that was you know a neat yeah. little effect. And then one other thing, like anytime they show denizens of hell or people that are already dead, they have that fuzzy effect they apply over the camera. Oh yeah. Because uh, when Bell invites her friends from over the mountain, because that's the only people that actually shows up to Jabez's housewarming, they're all the spirits of the dam that she knows because they all have that effect. You know, that's kind of how the, mm -hmm. the the movie you know gives that you know information out to you. Which for the day was pretty good. Um, I'm going to say that despite me not liking older films, uh, this one was pretty jolly. Um, the devil definitely gave me some laughs, a few belly laughs, um, brought some joy to my life because I was kind of miserable watching the film. I don't, like I said, I don't, I don't like him. <laughs> he was really good. A great portrayal of the devil. Um, very inspiring. I did not know how many people he had inspired and it makes complete sense. Um, I thought, uh, Daniel Webster was a good boisterous type character that, you know, drove home what he stood for and you know was pretty decent during the trial even though i was like nah, shut up you know a couple times um i'm gonna give this one a three out of five okay because while like i said i hate black and white films i hate classics because i'm a terrible person uh this one was pretty good and especially the effects i mean oh my god considering the time we're talking about the 1940s here yeah, films had only been in, like, really, I mean, out there for maybe 20 or 30 years at most. And, I mean, you're talking about, like, 20, I mean, in, in that amount of time, they went from, like, literally having no sound and being, like, for, you know, running for maybe 20 minutes tops to, you know, like, the movies we think of today, so. Yeah, and the fact that this film was only, like, an hour and some change, it wasn't terribly long, I thought that was, I thought that was good. 
So that that concludes that portion of it. But like getting on to the next movie, I'm going to throw this over to Urena because I'm going to let her discuss Constantine, the 2005 film. If you enjoyed this episode of Death Holler, the review of The Devil and Daniel Webster, please look forward to our next and final episode where we review Constantine. Death Holler is brought to you by Los Diablos Blancos Network with your host, the Reverend Dr. Death and La Yarena. Please like, subscribe, follow, and share. And if you feel so inclined, leave a review. We'll catch you next time. And don't forget to bring your death certificate.